Well, good afternoon, uh, and welcome to uh, the round two of our breakout sessions. This is uh, the session on engaging men in sexual violence prevention work. Uh, we are delighted and honored to have as our panelists, first, Dr. Ellen Berkowitz, who uh, you, you've heard from this morning, uh, who is a, a, an award-winning and a renowned speaker, trainer, former counseling center director, uh, writer, uh, and we're just so delighted to have him here. Uh, we have Scott Etherton, who is at Oregon State University, uh, who is currently an equity associate there, uh, and is also on, you might have to correct me here, Scott, the Men's Engagement Subcommittee of the Oregon Attorney General Task Force on... Well done. Okay, well done. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's it's well done. Your head. And I, uh, yeah, exactly. And I came here from Oregon, and uh, we knew about Scott, and we were delighted that he was willing to cross the border in this instance and talk at the state of Washington. It's good to be back home. So, uh, yeah. We also have Molly Monaghan Freshman. We're delighted to have Molly here. Molly is currently an independent consultant, but has uh, more than 18 years of experience as a as a student affairs a, a staff person, but also as a researcher, um, and uh, has worked with the military, and is actually right in our backyard here, uh, near, uh, near the Joint Base uh, Lewis McCord. So we, we, we were able to bring Molly on board as well. So uh, just a little bit of uh, introduction, introduction of the session before I hand it to Alan. Alan's going to start, uh, this is what we agreed to do when we talked a couple weeks ago. Uh, we'll be flexible. <laughs> Alan's gonna start by talking about theories and principles and best practices in men's engagement. Uh, Scott's task was to talk about challenges and obstacles and strategies that have been developed to respond to them. And Molly's assignment was to talk about what women need from men in uh, men's engagement in sexual <coughs> violence and, uh, prevention and response. And where, wherever else the conversation takes us or wherever you want to take it. So I'm gonna pass it to Ellen, please. Hello everybody. <laughs> In many cultures, we would all be taking a nap now and sleeping. <laughs> so, um, we respect your stomach's need to close your eyes if that's important. So, does everyone have this handout? If not, raise your okay. hand. So, could, could you use the microphone with the rain falling? It's oh, really hard to hear you guys. Yes, oh, thank, thank you, you for much. saying that. That was a good intervention. Okay, so this handout are really my personal beliefs or philosophy for those of us who want to work with men to end violence against women. So it's not something that I give out to participants in a workshop. And a lot of these are really what I would call more higher level ideas that would eventually come out in the discussion. But I wouldn't start with some of these things. It's really for us to think about ourselves. And I would say if you don't agree with it, that's totally fine, but it's just something to think about. So my personal belief with number one is that if we didn't have sexism, we wouldn't have violence against women. Or let's say it wouldn't be unequally distributed. We would have an equal amount of violence against women and men and from men and from women. So if we really look at the roots of violence against women, we have to look at the gender inequalities in our society and the way men and women are treated differently from birth. And that should be part of our awareness as anti-violence educators. When I work with the military, the real question I would love to ask is to have everyone's secret, honest response to the fact that, do you really think the military is better off with women? Now, I would personally be able to say yes, even though I'm not one of them. <laughs> But as long as someone is harboring the belief that this isn't okay, then that creates this fertile environment for violence, and it's the same in civilian society. So that would be point one. And because it's not only due to inequality, but it's always perpetuated by men, almost always, we need to understand it as a men's issue. And a lot of people who are very public spokespersons for this issue point out very often when the violence against women by men issue goes into the media, it gets de-gendered. So we talk about school violence. And we don't name it. And we need to name it. And naming it means we also have violence against men by men, and violence against women by women, and violence against men by women. But almost always mostly violence against women by men. So we need to do, and even in, some people will jump up and say, 
Well, like in middle schools, girls harass boys, but if you look at the literature, the, the outcomes of that is very different, which is more girls get injured and boys don't get harmed. So we always need to look deeper into it and see how violence in our society is gendered in some way. And that needs to be our understanding of the violence. But believe me, I would never get up in front of a group of men in a workshop and say, okay guys, here's the starting point of our discussion. You have a discussion in which it comes out of the discussion, and the other panelists will talk about that. I said something this morning about accountability, and I believe very firmly as a principle that if anyone wants to help end a problem that another group experiences, they have a responsibility to be in a meaningful, professional and personal dialogue with those other individuals to make sure that what they're doing is accomplishing what we think it wants. And there are some times when men, to use the metaphor, we kind of just ride in our white horse and we go off and we say, okay, I'm here now, I'll take care of this. And we act as if it's like we have ownership of this. And we're really committing the same crime that we're trying to end in a different form. So if I hear of a popular men's anti-violence program that alienates the women activists in that community, that's a red flag. That means something is wrong. Now this is not easy because men have not learned to take orders from women. Right? That's another good thing that's happening about the military, right? A lot of young men are learning to take orders from women. That's good for, for the health of our society, I believe. But a lot of the rest of us haven't learned how to do this. So none of this is going to be easy, but we have to define what that means with the people in our environment that also are involved in this issue and also in our personal relationships. <coughs> when I say it cannot be addressed without considering other oppressions, including racism, sexism, homophobia, and that they're all related. So for instance, if you get in a room, if you have some male facilitators in a room with men, and you have a really deep discussion about violence against women, where people really start being honest. Homophobia always jumps out. It's like that little toy we had, and you wind it up, and in some moment the clown pops out. Like, homophobia is always there with men, because it's what we were taught from the moment we were born that we don't want to be, which is like women, which, by the way, is sexism, so there we go back to point one. So, we have to make it safe to have these conversations. <coughs> now, if I'm in a group of male activists, one of the signs of health is if the gay or bi men can be out in that group. It's a little different when you're working with women, and we're not going to talk about that, but what I find is that when women do anti-violence work, the women of color have to check their race at the door. And so that's a different way we need to realize we need to be all of ourselves at every moment in this work. And if we don't make a space for us to be all of ourselves, we're not doing this work. And by the way, as a man, that means I'm homophobic, so I might as well admit it. I mean, that's what I was taught. I mean, I think I've done a lot of work to get over it. There's an article on my website called Coming Out to My Homophobia and Heterosexism, <laughs> where I kind of like go through my process in stripping it off. So we need to be open to have those other conversations. And looking at it from a different way, there's what people in the field call adversity strengths, that when you experience adversity, that builds up psychological strengths. Mm -hmm. So for instance, in the domestic violence field, if you're working with male perpetrators and you're working with men of color, men of color understand privilege, right? Because they've been dealing with white privilege their whole lives. So mm -hmm. that gives them an edge on understanding their male privilege in abusing their wives. So you can't leave any of these things out. <coughs> and as I said, if you get into a really good discussion, it will come out by itself. But you have to make the space for that safety. Once I was doing a bystander intervention training, and we were role playing the phrase, that's so gay, and how do you respond to that? And that one's a little more complicated because it's become so normalized. So, I was doing a role play, and this really brave young man raised his hand, and he said, I could never do what you're doing. And I said, why? He said, because if I did what you're doing, that person would accuse me of being gay. And I said, well, that, now you've got your homework. Like, you have to figure out why that would bother you so much. If you know what you are, then what does it matter? 
but it's that fear. Right? And of course, the bullies keep other men in place by using that as a weapon. I think from the keynote this morning, it's clear that we always want to focus on the positive. And to focus on the positive is not ever to deny the negative. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. But to utilize the positive to inhibit the negative and empower people to follow their hearts. Now, I like to say, if you're religious or spiritual, you might believe you have a soul. And you could just say, well, it's just your superego, or it's your conscience, whatever it is, your values, right? Whatever it is that makes you feel uncomfortable, we want you to act on that. And whatever that it is, whatever you call it, it's evoked with a positive language, a positive discussion. And the other thing is that shaming has been such a negative part of the male experience. Being made, we, we fit in, we're not real men, we don't belong, etc. That's why I said this morning, I don't like real men campaigns. Then we need to avoid triggering any of that shame and guilt that men are already feeling about whether or not they're the right kind of men. So a positive approach which acknowledges the negative but which is delivered in a positive manner. I think if we assume that all of us as men and women grew up in a culture that taught us unhealthy things about being men and women, then this is very personal. Like you can't avoid it being personal. You can't avoid it being about yourself. And if you're a man, you're going to put your foot in your mouth and you're going to make mistakes and you're going to upset someone. So you have to view that as an opportunity. I don't know if any of you have ever been for training by the National Coalition Building Institute, but they do a lot of diversity training. Well, they have one exercise where you spread out your arms and you say, I love making mistakes. <laughs> and the person with you says, I love, the, I, I welcome your mistakes around, like she, Molly could say, I welcome your mistakes around women. I hate that exercise. <laughs> I can't stand that exercise. But if you really do it, then the next time you make a mistake, you go, oh, that's OK. I was programmed to do that. Now's a chance to get rid of it. And she'll give me some feedback to help me realize why I'm not going to say that the next time. So we need to understand it's a really a personal healing journey. And the facilitators we train will put their foot in their mouth and get us in trouble and make big mistakes. And that's part of the process, too. And I think it's about, um, it's about being all of us able to express our full and complete humanity, however we define that for ourselves. And certainly, those of us that study the gender box and all those exercises, we realize that violence against women is the result of an immense restriction of men's humanity about ourselves. And Harry Broad, who's a scholar in men's studies, has this great phrase. He says, the disadvantages of the advantages of being a man. And that's very important, because it doesn't duck the privilege issue. It doesn't avoid the fact that we have tremendous unearned privilege, but it acknowledges that we pay a price. And as I said this morning, every time a woman is afraid of me and walks from the other side of the street, I pay a price. But I agree with her decision. Um, so the last one is what I talked about this morning. Because if, if you assume that most, most men want to do the right thing or have healthy underlying attitudes, and, they hi and we hide it, then if you create a safe space for men to have an honest discussion, then all that stuff will come to the surface. So I don't really like scripted workshops. I don't like workshops with 10 minutes, 5 minutes, 15 minutes, you turning the pages. You can design a scripted workshop, but when people get in a really good discussion, I like to say, go with the energy. Let people have the good discussion. As long as it's a good discussion, that's really thought-provoking. And then at the end you say, that's great, I'm so sorry we have to end that, but could you all just be patient with me? There's some stuff we didn't talk about, I just want to give it to you real quick. And then people are open, they'll take it in better than if you like forced it and broke the discussion. So if I'm doing a research study with Chris Gittich, it isn't a good skill because it needs to be very anal and structured and methodical <laughs> so we can test it. But even then you can build in times when it has a free flow. 
So I think that's very important. And the other thing is that part of the price of being male is that we don't get a chance to have really honest discussions with other men about ourselves. So if we do that in a workshop that's very compelling and that's actually undoing our negative gender socialization. So that by and of itself is a very powerful experience for men. So I'll stop there. That just remember, that is, this is for us. Like if I do a workshop, I don't use the words sexism or patriarchy, but I let it come up on its own and then I'll say, that's what people call me when they say patriarchy. So then people can take it in instead of putting it out first and then people run away from it. So difficult for me to start um, in part because I don't know what would be most helpful for, for our dialogue. Uh, but I think I'll just start with <coughs> sharing some of the presentations I've been doing. And um, it's been more large group, so um, predominantly male audiences or entirely male audiences, um, athletics, um, including just specific teams, football, baseball, et cetera, um, ROTC programs, uh, fraternity uh, houses, where we're bringing together a group of individuals because they have a shared activity that they are involved with, which is the other thing I find kind of interesting about a lot of men's engagement is activity seems to be kind of a necessary part of that. There's something about not just being male, but I think in part because of the privilege and the socialization that comes with that, it's not that I'm a man, it's I'm part of this group, and this is what we do. So meet them where they are, and, and so if it's an athletic team, then uh, typically it would be me, it might be me and a, and a colleague, um, that will kind of start with some basic activities. And there are probably things you've all have seen or heard of where um, maybe some empathy development at the beginning. Um, the one in Borstadt, have them think about the four most closest women in their world, um, sisters, partners, moms, whomever. Um, and then kind of what we do is then shift into more of a conversation about how to respond when someone were to report to them uh, disclosed to them that they were assaulted. And what we're trying to do in that is, is some empathy development, but then also get at this response because kind of like Alan's already alluded to, typically there's this, I'm gonna do something about this, right? And so, and again, that's part of your conditioning. Um, it's how I kind of entered this this work is, I wanna do something about it, I was gonna, you know, all sorts of thoughts I had, speaking out of my own privilege and um, kind of wanting to fix things and stop things from happening and kind of in a um, police oriented sort of mindset. And um, so meeting them where they are in that, um, we kind of talk about what would be your response if someone was um, at a party, you see your sister or whoever that close person is, um, they're clearly intoxicated and they're being walked upstairs, what would you do? And of course, usually I have to back them off of killing the person because that's the first thing they often respond to. And it's interesting how often violence is the first thing that comes out of the mind. Right? It's just boom, violence. And so we'll spend some time kind of unpackaging that a little bit because I don't want to let that go because it is part of the dialogue about, you know. So we, we think in these terms, um, how is that helpful for you? How is it not helpful for you? How is it helpful for the person that uh, the survivor has it not helpful for the survivor. And we've heard stories of individuals disclosing to their resident advisor they were assaulted and the resident advisor punches the wall out of anger and walks off and leaves the survivor sitting there and not sure what to do next. Mm -hmm. So if you really want to help somebody, what is it you need to do to be really fully there for them? And then as we walk through sort of the, what most of us have for kind of responses to a survivor when there's a disclosure in terms of taking care of somebody, we kind of walk through, why would you listen and believe? Get into false reports, get into um, uh, people's the barriers for reporting. Um, and in the process of talking about how we respond, we also then take care of, in some ways, um, some of the things that are already in their minds around sexual violence. So, you know, false reports, some of the other myths. Um, who's responsible for the act? 
those sort of things. And in the process of doing that, we're really sharing a lot with them about kind of the, um, some of the, the dynamics of sexual violence. Um, and again, kind of approaching it from a not shaming. So um, assuming that they're all wanting to help and I know in that audience of 100 plus men that I have survivors, I have rapists, I have a whole gamut of individuals that depending on where they're coming from in the world, um, are probably having a lot of reactions to what I'm saying. Um, and then, you know, giving them a chance to kind of respond. And um, I don't know if it would be more helpful to share some of that or maybe wait for some questions to pop up and, and then we can get into that. Um, so I don't know if you want a chance to share some things and then sure. kind of go from there. Sure. <coughs> so, um, Again, my name is Molly Monahan Kreischman. Just to give you a little bit of additional background on where I'm coming from. Um, so I have an undergrad in psychology and women's studies, a master's in higher ed administration, a PhD in um, college student personnel, essentially higher ed administration. My doctoral research is on the lived experience of sexual assault survival for women in college. Um, and that's what I do now. I visit campuses and help students, faculty, staff kind of address that. But the reason that uh, I guess I was invited to be on this panel uh, is the decade of work that I did uh, working with men um, <coughs> at a large public institution um, and, and specifically fraternity men. So, um, so I'll kind of uh, talk a little bit about that program and then um, my lessons learned or um, my uh, uh, recommendations for men doing this work um, kind of thing. So um, when I started my PhD at the University of Maryland, uh, the graduate assistantship that I um, took on at that time was the sexual assault prevention piece. And um, the group the, of students that I was handed over was uh, predominantly women, uh, maybe had one man, and um, <clears throat> the group was great. They did great work. Um, one of the things that I noticed, uh, however, was that this one young man that we had, um, you know, it, it felt like the weight of the world was on his shoulders. Um, that he not only came to the table with this social socialization of sort of needing to be that night on the on the horse on the white horse sort of swooping in and, and saving the day um, but that he existed in these other environments that shamed him for that uh, not necessarily being the knight but being the one guy speaking out about sexual assault right so he becomes the rape guy he becomes shamed for that um, this particular student that I'm talking about was a fraternity man so we started trying to talk to the fraternities about um, sort of what this might look like. And we um, simultaneously created a program for women too, but that's a session for another day. Um, so <coughs> essentially, fast forward a few years and um, the uh, Department of Fraternity and Sorority Life is sort of banging their head against the wall wondering what do we do about this stuff. Um, the um, you know, Cleary was uh, sort of fresh um, and new, and um, we started getting some additional reporting. A lot of those locations were sort of being named as fraternity houses, which was a sort of interesting piece. And so um, the Fraternity and Sorority Life came over and said, okay, please, please help us, you know, after we've been for years trying to get in there. Um, and I said, okay, well, I've got this idea. If you're up for it, Here's the idea. Let's get some great facilitators in to a bunch of fraternity houses. Let's get 10 men to commit to a semester from each fraternity. Um, we'll opt in for just a few fraternities to start, right? Um, I think we had five or six or so that first semester. Um, I think I facilitated most of the groups that semester um, just to get us started. So 10 guys in every group, um, spending about an hour with each of them, usually in the evening, 
Um, and um, uh, would sort of go through a similar curriculum to what um, you were talking about. And then five men would stay and five new men would come on board and you know, we would start the process from there. So, um, so, and I guess I can speak more to that a little bit later, but. Um, so in terms of working with those young men, I, I definitely, oh, so I'm sorry, just to pull us back to that original student, the, the sort of thought behind the, it was called the 10 man plan. The sort of thought behind the 10 man plan was that if we had some backup for this one particular person whose job it had become to sort of carry the weight of the world on his shoulders in terms of like changing all of rape culture in the fraternity community, right? That that might be helpful to him to have some backup. Um, and so then in his fraternity, he did have another 10. And then the next semester brought five more on top of that. And the next semester brought five more. And so eventually after 10 or so years of doing that, you can imagine the kind of culture shift that started happening um, after these students are able to be in this um, conversation. So a couple of things throughout that process. Um, so um, so okay, as a facilitator, as an educator, you want the students to become empowered. You want for them to sort of take ownership, right? But there's this interesting flip that happens when you are the woman who's brought the idea forward, the woman who did all of the work developing the program, the woman who brought the research behind and the philosophies behind this program to the table, this woman who worked and worked and worked for years to bring this to the attention of certain administrators on campus, and then these administrators take it on, and it's this great success. And then suddenly there begins to be this piece where um, and I have to say, Alan, thank you so much for um, the space to talk about this because as you were, uh, Alan asked me to talk about, okay, so what do you need for men doing this work? And it gave me pause because I have never, in my almost 18 years of experience working in the field, have never, ever had a man ask me that. And I, I work with men, like I work with a lot of men. Right? So what do you need to do this work? And it was sort of like, huh, you really want to know that. And I know Alan's research and I know, you know, so that, that seemed like a good, understandable thing that uh, Alan Berkowitz would ask, right? But um, it was this moment for me as a professional to sort of say, oh, wow. Because there are a lot of these moments where, um, I've done all the work and have done all the research and I'm the one with the 10 years, 15 years or more experience. I'm the one with the PhD and yet someone else, typically male, is getting all of the accolades for the programs that I've been putting together. Um, so I had a confrontation with one of the, um, so we had a, a men's anti violence grant for a little while, that we didn't have anyone hired to start the program. So I did the first four months. We hired someone, he came on for about 10 months and then left, and then I finished the whole program. Um, and it was interesting, just another example of one of those um, situations. So I was there for those four months. I planned the entire four months at the beginning, um, we brought Jackson Katz to campus. And when, and I have a lot of respect for Jackson Katz and I, I recommend him highly. Um, but I was not at the forefront anymore when Jackson came to campus. And so Jackson got on stage and uh, thanked men for bringing him. I can't blame Jackson for that. I, I don't know where to put my finger on the blame for that, except for this sort of culture that we live in, right? So it's just an interesting moment. Um, I think essentially, so um, 
So in terms of working with men, I'll just make a couple more points and then we can open it up. Or um, So um, I, I think one of the first things that I think, and I guess these, um, oh, I will share one more thing. The, the man who did come on board to do um, that little bit of time in between our long men's anti-violence grant, um, I did become very frustrated with him at some point and I said, you know, the men who do this work need to do the work. And he got really frustrated with me. And he said something along the lines of, you know, a lot of women push men out of this work. You know, I'm not going to be pushed out of this work. And I thought, what? <laughs> okay, so that's a whole other thing. But I think that it's another piece of this, right? So, right. Okay, so um, one of the things that Alan brought up was this sense of being able to call each other on your stuff, right? Or as men doing this work, being open to women calling you on your stuff, right? And, um, and I think that that's huge, and having an openness to that is really huge. And being uh, um, proactive about making that statement up front because it's not an assumption. If you show up as a man and you say I'm a feminist, it's not an assumption that you welcome feedback from women, right? That's not how we necessarily come to the table. Um, um, so when I was working with the undergraduate men, one of the pieces that I also became frustrated with was the sense of, as I was um, mentioning before, empowering them to do this work, but then hitting this point with them where it felt like I had missed a step. So they forgot that I had been there with them, right? That this female space, this female entity had been there with them, educating them. And so that's a piece that I, I sort of reflect on a little bit in terms of how do I instill that better in the young men that I work with in terms of helping them remember, helping them start with uh, a, a woman brought me to this point. Um, and um, I think I'll stop there for now. Sorry, I just wanted to add a couple more uh, elements. Thanks for, for sharing that. Um, one of the things I found really, really helpful, um, specific around uh, the fact that I approach this work with a tremendous amount of privilege, um, is having colleagues, um, women that, that I work with in the office. Um, much of the work I did with the groups of men um, was with Carrie Geis, who's now at Iowa State, um, journalist Carrie. Just phenomenal work in this area. Um, and actually, at the end of sessions, um, having making sure we schedule some time for coffee where I could say, you know, because believe me, there were times when I put my foot in my mouth or said something I thought was going to be really awkward, and it came out, and I look over to Carrie, like, help, and she's like, I can't help you. you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's all you know. <laughs> Dig out. Um, so uh, I, I think it's just important to kind of approach it with that humility. So if you're a man in this work, you, you've got to stay connected, and, you know, tell me what you're thinking. Hey, you said that, it sounded like you were, you know, pay attention to victim blame, or pay attention to... Um, speaking from your own privilege, are you open to stuff enough that regardless of how they're identifying, um, that they're able to, to approach you? And, and so I just can't, you know, say that enough to stay engaged in that way. If I approach my coworker and I say, look, I'm approaching this work with a lot of privilege, and I get that I'm only seeing pieces of this, can you help me with it? I get a tremendous amount of feedback. I've opened the door for it. And so it's, it feels safer giving me that feedback. And so um, that's one way, if, if you're really wanting to do this well, to, to ask for that feedback, because you will get it, I promise. <laughs> I just wanted to dissect what Molly said her colleagues said to her, because I think it's very profound. So did I write this down correctly? A lot of women push men out of this work, and I'm not going to let you push me out of this work, right? Yep. So first of all, you see how that's based on an adversarial view of gender? Guess what? An adversarial view of gender is one of the characteristics of rape proclivity. Men who are prone towards assaulting women see gender as adversarial. So that's reproducing the problematic culture. 
Now, now we know that early in this movement, it was very controversial for men to be in this work. And there were women activists who had devoted their lives to this who didn't want us here. So my view is if I met someone who felt that way, I would say, tell me more. It sounds like you really don't want me here. And I would view it as a compliment that she was willing to vent her anger on me. So, and Molly clearly isn't that person that I'm referring to. But even if it was, it needs to be handled differently. And my opinion is, how should I say this? If we're not doing it right, women have a right to push us out. Well, can I add something to that as well? I wrote the grant application. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote the men's anti-violence grant application. So I was welcoming <laughs> men's engagement. So I just think it's like what I would call a juicy remark. Mm -hmm. And if we unpack the remark, and we try and understand what are some of the underlying feelings, maybe that this man was feeling, we could see there's a different way to approach it and a way that fosters what we are calling an accountability and ally relationship as opposed to a competitive, turf-owning adversarial relationship. <coughs> and also, I'll just go a little further out on the limb. <laughs> if Molly was there first, and she wrote the grant. It's like all the historical incidences of the new group stealing the land of the existing group and then telling them they don't own their own land. And that's very true in American history. It's very true in the Southwest. It's very true with our native peoples. So we can even go deeper and see that there's maybe a kind of colo colonial mentality that is part of the issues we need to deal with. Thank you. So we do have a, a few questions that we got in writing, and keep writing questions if you have them. Two questions that I got fairly early in the session that I think you have been trying to answer without knowing it, but, I, but I'll ask them and see if you have additional comments. Uh, two questions really, kind of the same question with different specific uh, questions. The general question is, why this focus on engaging men in this session? Um, and then the two separate questions around that were, what if, why not address the issues of the, the cultural issues um, and engaging the culture, not just men? And the other question was, why the gender binary? Why, why aren't we addressing transgender students, et cetera? So uh, I think as a member of the planning committee, I probably owe you an answer on that as well, but I'll save mine to, to last. First of all, address the transgender issue, which is a important issue to be thinking about. And I would say this. Because most people are living inside of a cultural binary, we need to meet them where they are. But when we meet them where we are, we need to acknowledge that the binary that they believe in might not be the only way to think about it. So we don't have to affirm the binary in one sense, but we have to acknowledge that if we talk about those issues beyond the binary, we're going to lose most people. And most of the people committing the violence are inside the binary. So I think we have to live with the binary independently of how we feel about it without colluding with it. And that would mean bringing in examples. A lot of times I give examples where the two names of the people could be male or female, and then I say, who did you think that was? You know, there's many ways to people's challenge, assumptions, people's about it, agenda, but I think we have responsibility to meet them where they are. I think because of, because of what I said in the beginning, that violence is gendered. And, you know, if men really respected and honored and valued women's input equally, we probably wouldn't need to do this. But because men have more influence over other men at this point in history, we need to make that a positive influence and not a negative influence. So both of the two questions, in a way, have to do with Acknowledging realities that we might not agree with or like, but that are where we have to start. So, and I'll, just as a member of the planning committee, without belaboring it, I'll answer this a little bit. Uh, so, uh, we knew that in a one-day conference, we were going to have to make some tough choices, and we ended up collapsing some topics. So there was a session this morning, actually, about cultural factors, that actually tried to get at both of those issues that were on your questions. 
but it's in a more generalized way. I don't know if we wrote a good enough description for that session. I don't know if any of you were in that session or not. So we tried to address that. Uh, and I was also, uh, we had a student here briefly who left, uh, but he was asking why are there students here? And uh, that was another issue we, we grappled with. And uh, our original planning was to have a student event that, that over, that over um, that started in the afternoon and overlapped with this event. And the planning for that did not get off the ground uh, well enough either. So we, we, had, we made some difficult decisions and we knew that in a one-day conference we were going to be collapsing some topics and not addressing others. But this is a topic that rose to the topic of the planning agenda very quickly and stayed there. And so uh, that's why the session on the agenda. So. Okay, uh, yes, please. Um, and I think just sort of adding to what uh, Alan was saying, um, in terms of where to go when you're having these conversations with so um my philosophy when i was working with the men was very much sort of meet them where they're at start where they're at and when there were moments to sort of start to interject start to broaden right so uh the fraternities that i worked with um were um white, historically white, um, uh, were existing in fraternity and sorority life, which is very much in support of a gender binary. Um, the, they um, very much uh, exist in a heteronormative space, even though um, we know for a fact that many me members are um, not only all along a sexual orientation spectrum, but also a gender identity spectrum. Um, so, in those moments where you're able to sort of identify, okay, we could, we could talk about some transgender issues here, or we could talk about um, some LGBT issues here. We could talk about um, the power dynamic, or the experience that your brothers of color have here in this group um, when, you know, 95 of you are white, right? So you can start, and then, and then you really start being able to unpack a little bit more too this piece about um, social justice and um, multiple and intersecting oppressions and um, stuff can start to get good, right? But I think First, you have to start with sort of where they're at. But we can't take advantage of those opportunities to have those conversations if we haven't <coughs> done the work in ourselves to be able to articulate those issues. You know, I love this role because it's the only way I get my exercise. So thank you for <laughs> humoring me. So these are two questions uh, about engaging men. I'm asking to drill down a little bit. Uh, one is, what do you need from men especially men who carry or who are perceived to have power and privilege to help programs succeed. And the other question is, do you have suggestions on working with men, we straight men, when you as a facilitator are gay? Sorry, Joe, can you remind me the first one? <laughs> what is this, a game show? Yeah. <laughs> what do you need from men, especially men who carry or who are perceived to have power or privilege to help the program succeed? Thank you. So one of the things that, that I'll do, um, and of course it's different when you're working with the football team because you can't look out and see who the captains are. Uh, with the military, it's much more, you know who the leaders are going to be, uh, or they're wearing that on, on the sleeve or wherever. Um, and their role on campus, though, is still very similar. So I would say that when I'm presenting to a group of men, part of what I use as a way to get them to the table in the first place is kind of their role as a leader. And so um, they may not want, many times um, coaches have said to me, well, why am I giving so much time in a division one institution where win-loss is all that matters, that, you know, long-term, um, why am I giving you this time with my, my athletes? Um, I come back with, and of course the question is also with, do we have any complaints with our unit? Right? Are you really doing this because you're hearing stuff and should I know this as a coach? So where I go is, you have leaders. 
And the, military, the ROTC folks get this pretty clearly. Um, fraternities get it as well, that they are trying to create leaders. And so I use that as kind of a way to get myself into their space, wherever they are. And I go to them. I go to the fraternity house. I go to the athletics department. I go to the ROTC, um, wherever they're housed. And, and so that's one way to actually say, part of why I'm here is because I need your help. There's a problem nationally, and there's a problem on our campus, and, and here's how I need your, your help. And so that's one way to actually, I think, get at the table. And the, the second question, I've worked with a variety of different presenters, um, and we, um, just the work that we're doing, again, broad audiences, we bring in um, scenarios and, and we'll talk through various issues um, and be pretty clear we're not making assumptions about you know any one given situation about um, gender identity or expression or sexual orientation. I mean, that hasn't seemed to be, at least in the larger group, hasn't seemed to come up. Um, so I don't, I don't know, I can't really speak more to that. You know, when you, when you, when you do this work, one of the questions that people want to know is if you're gay. And in high school, they'll like ask you, in college, they're too polite. <laughs> and if you think about it, it's because you're not a normal man. Like there's something wrong with you. So what could that be? Are you gay? So what I always say is, could you tell me why that would make a difference? Like I don't buy, I don't answer that question. I force them to examine why they would ask that question and why that would make a difference. But as I understood the question, if the facilitator identifies as gay, then it's a tactical issue, and I don't really know if I could answer that. It's first of all, if you want to be out to that group, that's a personal decision. Second of all, it's how you want to bring that in. And third of all, I would just say in general, as a <coughs> principle, I believe when possible to co-facilitate this. And I believe in facilitating pairs that are seemingly different from each other. So like if you have an athlete and you have someone who's in theater or something, but you put two men together who look on the surface to be different, and then they present a united front as men, however we define it, in addressing the importance of this issue. I think that's healthy. And I think in that context, it would be fine for someone to be out as a facilitator. But personally, I think it would work better if that person wasn't alone. And that's not necessarily because of the sexual orientation, but just because of my philosophy of effective facilitation. I think the other thing, and I'm just going to be honest with you all, part of what I think of every time I get in front of a group of men, especially when some of them weigh close to 300 pounds and it's all on the shoulders, <laughs> um, how I present to them is in the forefront of my brain. I mean, that's something I, I just, Part of who I am and my upbringing and what I am. You mean like I come how to the table. you show up, like physically? How I physically show up. Yeah. I think about, do I appear man enough to these guys that I can present this in a way that they're going to hear me? Yeah. And I, the reason I say that is because it's important that you all understand that this is part of what I'm bringing into this. I, I'm, I'm kind of showing up as part of the problem, I think, in some ways. And so just to, to disclose that a little bit, that that's part of that internal wrestling that um, goes on for me, and it's part of what I think Alan was saying. When we have to check this for ourselves as we move in this. So I just wanted to bring that out to you. I think about how we dress, I think about how we look, and yes, I have four earrings, but um, <laughs> but you know that that also goes through my brain. What does that mean? How are they going to interpret that? Well, a lot of you are familiar with the work of Men Can Stop Rape, and the, one of the original founders of Men Can Stop Rape. Well, one of them is now in Portland out here on the West Coast, but the other one, Jonathan Stillerman, he used to give this presentation called Gender Offenders. And basically the assumption is, if a man is doing this work, he is seen as offending against the gender. And so people project all this stuff on you, like, are you gay? Are you trying to get in good with women? Did you get in trouble and now this is your punishment? <laughs> and that whole way of thinking is itself a product of the problem. Because why shouldn't I be doing this? Because it's a great important thing to do that all men should want to be doing. 
Actually, I was talking to one of the people from the base this morning who's a victim advocate, who's male, who's also in a leadership role. And I said, well, what do people, the guys give you a hard time about being a male victim advocate? And I got the greatest answer I've ever heard, and I don't remember exactly what he said, but it was basically like a positive, affirming, well, why wouldn't I want to do this? This is really important response. So that's part of what we always have to keep on doing. It's like we're always undoing all the stuff that needs to be undone, including in ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that's why we need allies from the other gender if we are in the gender binary <laughs> to point stuff out that we're not seeing. And that's why we need allies outside of the gender binary to point out the gender binary. And that's the work. I think just to add to that, I mean, just in terms of how you show up, it matters, right? I mean, we're all socialized to um, come to the table with assumptions about anyone who shows up in front of us, right? And so I think <clears throat> for me also, being a woman doing this work, going into fraternity houses um, as a woman doing this work, uh, I, I probably approach things quite differently than these guys because um, I have a couple other walls to break down before they'll be really open and honest with me, right? Um, believe me, we got there. <laughs> they were very open and honest with me. Um, uh, and it didn't take too long. But you just sort of have to, I guess, no matter how you show up, you do show up. There are assumptions that people will make about you and you have to find a way to connect. Um, and those relationships are really important. <clears throat> it's one of the things that I really loved about working with fraternity men was that I got to sit with them every single week for an hour. I got to know them really well. Um, you know, uh, when I was pregnant and, you know, waddling down to fraternity row, <laughs> uh, that, that would have been a potentially uh, different and interesting way that I was showing up for them, right? But we were already past that. We were just human beings in a room together at that point. So, um, yeah, I just think there's always that piece. Okay, here's a question um, from the community college folks, and Alan, you were talking to the presidents about this, so this might be a question for you. How do we engage men to change the culture in a commuter-based or community college setting? Well, first of all, we have to acknowledge that the way the problem shows up is different in the community college. So this morning we had the example of an angry ex-partner coming onto campus to find their partner. So community college environment is very different. However, in terms of being a bystander, we're all bystanders all the time wherever we live. And the place to start is with people's discomfort. So let's say on a one to 10 scale, we took a poll and we agreed that we should all be uncomfortable for anything over five. Whatever that is, it doesn't matter. That's like our cutoff. And we're working with a group of people that are only uncomfortable with eight, nine, and 10. We don't spend all our time arguing with them about why they should be uncomfortable about five, six, and seven. We start with teaching them to intervene with what they're uncomfortable with, with eight, nine, and 10. So you always start with people's place of discomfort. And in a community college, the, the place and the location of the discomfort may be different because it's off campus. But the internal dynamics are the same. <coughs> Maybe the issue is different because we don't have allies. Because if you and I live in a residence hall and we're both trained together, then I know you're going to back me up. So we'll both intervene together. But then maybe we say, make sure you create some allies before you intervene. So I think the process in this case is the same, but the setting might be different and the tactics might be different. And it might be more important to make sure you're not going out on a limb without having backup. So in terms of what I presented this morning, I might spend more time in a community college setting encouraging people to talk to the other bystanders before they <coughs> intervene so they get a sense of the environment. And while I would also encourage that in a residential campus anyway, you can make more assumptions that you're on the same page because you know you're you're together more often. 
How would you, this is for all of you, thank you. How would you handle a discussion in which the majority of participants agree on an erroneous <coughs> norm, such as, quote, women are often equally responsible, unquote? So, one of the things that I loved about the 10-man plan is this piece about the transition and turnover, so that every semester, um, five men would stay, five new men would show up. So, questions like that would be challenging maybe semester one, maybe semester two, but semester two, semester three, once you have returners, um, they can sort of help with that. And I think especially as a woman responding to a question like that, I think it, uh, there are added layers of complication. Um, but once you're able to get some of that education out there, I've found that um, having those allies right there um, uh, to sort of jump in and answer those questions prior to you even having to was really helpful. Now I know I dodged that question just a little bit. I'm gonna uh, turn it over to these guys for that. <laughs> so depending on how it's presented, I'll often just address it head on. So sometimes we'll do a scenario and the correct answer is, well, I intervene or I'd say something um, I'd either say something to the individual that is causing this, you know, inappropriate statement, or I'd say something to the person that's been receiving it for support. And someone might say, um, you know, you have to be ready for the smart aleck answers too. Um, someone will give the right answer. One of the guys in the group will say, well, I'd ask the guy to stop. And you hear this chuckle off to the side behind them. Well, that's them sending a very strong message to this guy, you got a line. And um, so we'll, we'll call that. So what, So I heard you're gonna interrupt and I heard a lot of laughter. What's the laughter about? Is this uncomfort that someone would, do you think it wouldn't happen? Do you think, so just trying to draw out of them where they're at from that perspective so that you can then address why that is. Why, why is it that you laugh? Why is it, and not to pick on the individuals because again, once I get into shaming, I lose and they shut down. So it's more about, I heard laughter, what's that about? And sometimes the other guys around the ones laughing will be the ones that sometimes answer. Um, but that's okay, because at least we're getting it out aloud. Um, and then uh, we were doing uh, an orientation with a, a large group of first year students, it was about a thousand folks, and kind of the pure theater sort of thing. So you can't, you can't see who's out there. It's dark in the theater, and someone made a comment. And we just kind of stopped the program and said, you know what, this program isn't for the one that just heckled. It's really a, a program for those sitting around that person. So if you're sitting around that individual, this is our, not only welcome to the school, but it's also our challenge to you to intervene when you hear things like that. And to, so then we kind of shift the conversation away from the person that made the comment into, how are you gonna to respond to this? So if it's something like, well, I think women are divine too, well, let's unpackage that first of all, but then also making sure that you're providing support for those guys that are on board and get it. Also, unless you did an anonymous confidential survey, I would not assume that the apparent norm is the real norm. In other words, are you really sure that most men really think that? So that's just a question. Maybe in this case you are. The other thing that I sometimes use as a tactic and I really agree that you have, we have responsibility to call out things and to not overlook them, and especially when it's pushback. The other thing is sometimes you can entertain someone's hypothesis as if it were true and then still make your point. So I might say, so if you assume that as a woman is responsible for putting herself in that situation, that there's some kind of responsibility for that. Do you think that gives somebody a right to take sexual advantage of her in that situation? And then that's why I would go in the discussion. And then I would say, in the end, I don't agree with you, but it, we've all agreed that it's totally wrong for someone to do that. So you don't need to get stuck by it, and you don't need to um, refute it. You need to show the flawed logic. And sometimes what happens is we get stuck on the extremes, like, we get stuck on, did Kobe Bryant really have permission? Well, I have my opinion about that, but you know what? If you consider yourself to be a respectable married man who loves his children and who's faithful to his wife, 
and wants to be a role model to young people, and you meet someone in the lobby, and two minutes later you're entering her from behind and you cause her to leave, that's unacceptable. And we don't need to argue about the rest. Same with the Duke lacrosse team. Read, you know, read the, the news on that. I, I'm sure that there was a rape. But if you look at the despicable behavior of the Duke lacrosse team during that incident, and the fact that one year before they were written up, there was a report written, this is all public information, that they're being disproportionately sanctioned. There, you can have enough evidence to make a clear and convincing argument and not deal with the audience's issues than to get into a big argument about the things they're not ready to talk about. So that's just more of a pedagogy. What might it look like to engage boys in sexual assault prevention? What interventions, K-12 interventions, are, are look like that are aimed at mitigating homophobia, racism, sexism? This work does not start in higher education. Well, in some ways, this is theoretical in terms of, for me, in terms of working with large groups of boys. Um, I have two sons and a daughter, and um, I will say that um, it was actually an honor to engage the boys in conversations about what it means um, to really be human and to be um, inclusive in their lives and to be thoughtful about who they are and how they identify and how others identify. And, and um, um, you know, they're doing great. They're, they're on board with a lot of, um, they are, and many of you with children will know this, they have no qualms about pointing out my different, my uh, shortcomings, um, including about social justice. And so for me, that, that meant something happened right. Now, maybe that's more my partner and less about me. Um, but um, I would love to see more work because what I hear from students is often ex a lot of knowledge about sex and very little knowledge about relationships. That's right. I teach early childhood. Can I just step up and say sure. it? Sure. <laughs> I'm from Spokane Falls Community College. I teach early childhood education, and I just think it's really important to let you know that we do start at the preschool level. There's a great book that's called Anti-Bias Curriculum by Louise Durbin Sparks, and we teach them about social justice from the very beginning. And I can't say for sure how far it goes up into the elementary, but I know there's a lot of character education out there, and a lot of those efforts help with bullying, with sexual assault violence, it's all the beginning of teaching them about social justice. So I think there are some things out there, but <coughs> pick up that book if you want to see that it's a very interesting, um, different way to approach it. It's called Anti-Bias Education or Anti-Bias Curriculum. She wrote the first one in the 80s and then in the 2000s, I think she updated it. ABC, Anti-Bias ABC, ABE. That's the two books. So we have about three minutes left. I do have one other question that um, I'd like the panel to try. Uh, society today is the least gender specific in modern history. Why have sexual assault crimes become more violent and prevalent today? Because the people who are more gender specific got angry. <laughs> the men. I mean, if you're really into being hyper masculine, you have more stuff to be angry about because the world isn't cooperating. I mean, the world still has a lot of problems, but let's say it's less cooperative. That's fine. <coughs> Alan, you have the mic. Do you want to say anything in closing? Thank you all for coming, and we hope that this is good use of your time. <laughs>